Welcome to Latinx and Social Work Discussion Series. We're about to get started in a couple of minutes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Richeline DeShields. I am the director of DEI at the Silver School of Social Work here at New York University. I am honored to hold space for this scholarship, this practice, this restorative healing of our beloved Latinx social workers, their tireless efforts, their daily work to restore humanity in the world is a noble and honored profession. So much of my scholarship and work centers around DEI, accountability and higher education. I'm excited to reimagine social work, DEI and higher education beyond just one program placed in Hispanic Heritage Month. Erica Sandoval and Dr. Linda LaSalle Bryan and I and others reimagined this work as an opportunity to shift the paradigm. With a community of partners, we set out to center the voices of the unrepresented Latinx social workers and the curriculum, the profession, the classroom, and supportive services. These efforts advance our mission to social justice, to bring care, and our pillars of transparency, accountability, trust, and community. Some of our programs here at um, NYU at the School of Silver um, has been involved around anti-racism um, work and seminars for students in our um, orientation, anti-racism training for our staff with our days of unlearning, anti-racism in our pedagogy for our faculty, um, our diversity, racism, oppression and privilege course, with our climate and wellness, we have a silver climate support protocol that centers the experiences of students, faculty, and staff. We have restorative justice training. We have healing circles. Our groups include white accountability groups for BIPOC faculty, for faculty, staff, and students. Our social emotional support for BIPOC students, which includes our alumni and residents program our diversity infrastructures and our strategic initiatives around our actions against racism. And of course, our leadership that includes our leadership team, our student councils, our faculty, our all staff, and our esteemed Dean Neil Guterman for his support and leadership of this Latinx and social work initiative would not be possible. And so we often talk about getting folks engaged and getting everyone on the bus. And we are so excited to have so many people come out today. I wanna to welcome our colleagues, our students, our friends to the community as we continue to work to eradicate all forms of oppression and undo white supremacy. It takes a community and we are happy today to choose to be a part of this community. Feel free to share and stay in contact with us as we learn and grow together. Whiteness is the location of structural oppression. It relates to power and privilege, both normalized and invisible. And the holding of whiteness today is going to be a wonderful discussion. I am happy to introduce my amazing, my talented co-facilitator in this work, Luisa Lopez, who serves as one of our distinguished alumni residents at Silver. Louisa brings her skills, her expertise to the community to help center the voices of Latinx students, their um, identity challenges, to provide support, to help transition to the profession and provide feedback and recommendation and insight as we, a community here at Silver, reimagine 
anti-oppressive practices. So thank you so much for joining us today. And Louisa, please take it away. Thank you so much, Richeline, for that introduction and good morning to everyone. My name is Louisa Lopez. My pronouns are she, her, ella, and I am a proud alum of the NYU Silver Class of 2018. I am honored to serve as one of the inaugural alums in residence at NYU Silver. And as the first alum in residence, I am so pleased to co-facilitate this discussion with my fellow authors today. The Latinx and Social Work Project is deeply connected to the role of alum in residence, and my goals of elevating the Latinx social workers and the profession as a whole. And I am so excited to join with these powerhouses in social work for our conversation today. Uh, I'm going to ask our uh, authors to please introduce themselves, tell us your name, your pronouns, and your current role, and we'll get started. Uh, let's start with Dr. Cindy Bautista Thomas. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, NYU, for facilitating such an amazing, important conversation. So I am a mother, a wife. I am the daughter of Isabel and Baudilio Bautista. I'm currently a doctoral lecturer at the College of Staten Island. Uh, the uh, Department of Social Work. I'm also co-founder of Velocity Visions, a consultancy that works with organizations. And I'm also, I, I wear many hats. I am also a clinical supervisor for clinicians in training. And so I'm so excited to be here and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cindy. Dr. Jasmine. Hi, um, so glad to be here. My name is Dr. Jasmine Colazzo. I too wear many hats and I feel like that is a social work norm. Um, so uh, thank you, Cindy, for really just putting that out there. Um, so my primary role is I'm a director of coaching for a mental health tech startup called MindRight. Um, we provide mental health uh, peer support and coaching to youth and adolescents. Um, I also have a part-time private practice and I um, thoroughly enjoy uh, being an adjunct lecturer for MSW students, which I see some of my students here. So hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Colazzo. Uh, Amelia Ortega, please. Hi, good morning. It's great to be here with so many folks. Uh, I'm Amelia Ortega, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a senior lecturer at Columbia School of Social Work. I'm also the sole proprietor of Amana Said uh, Feminist Psychotherapy, and I run a practice in New York that centers on racial healing and gender-based healing and trauma for LGBTQ and trans clients. Great Thank to be here. You. Thank you, Amelia. And finally, Dr. Laura Quiroz. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for holding space with us today. My name is Laura Kiros. My pronouns are she, her, and I am calling in um, from Montclair, New Jersey, on the land of the Lenape. Um, I am an associate professor of social work at Adelphi University, where I teach practice courses at the master's, doctoral, and an undergraduate level. I also have a consulting practice where I work with organizations, nonprofit, for profit, individuals, merging, really looking at the sincere work of diversity, equity, inclusion, and how that connects with an organization's mission. My work is really grounded in what I call trauma-informed diversity, equity, inclusion, so expanding that word of trauma and looking at not only interpersonal trauma, but sociopolitical trauma, the trauma of racism, classism, sexism, etc. And so I'm honored to hold space with all of you today. Thank you, NYU, and I am really looking forward to all of us sharing space with everyone today, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Laura, and thank you to all our panelists. It's gonna be an incredible discussion. Before we start, we do have a little bit of light housekeeping. Uh, I'm going to be asking the panelists some questions to facilitate our discussion. And I encourage all of our participants and our guests to, to drop your own questions in the chat and to engage with the panelists and with each other. We will be discussing some very deep topics uh, and we encourage you all to participate in the polls that will pop up to share your comments, your affirmations and your reactions in the chat and let us know your thoughts. At the end of the discussion, there will be a very short survey. I, I, I encourage you all to please fill it out. It takes less than a minute and will provide us with really great feedback to continue making this space as valuable and incredible as possible going forward. 
These discussions are meant to be interactive and immersive so that we can all walk away uh, with an excellent experience where we've learned a lot and can take that forward uh, to the next session. So please, I encourage you to be, participate as much as possible. That being said, let's get to it. I'm gonna start with a question to all of our panelists and, and anyone please feel free to jump in. Uh, and uh, there will be a poll, so I encourage all of our participants to please participate as well. So when you hear holding the weight of whiteness, what comes up for you? That's a very heavy question. So what, what comes up for you all when you hear that? I think for me, I just want to acknowledge the naming. I think all of us uh, really lean into language. And so when I heard um, whiteness, holding whiteness, it made me take a deep breath that we're actually naming this, right? I think many of you that are here today are here also because of the title, right? They were allowed to say this. Um, and so for me, that just made me, I think this work is not only intellectual and cognitive, but it lives in our bodies, right, in our spirits and our souls. And so I just want to lift up the naming of this workshop, because for me, it was a deep breath, and I literally felt my body relax into the space that we could start naming what is there in an intentional, explicit way. So thank you for that question. Laura, I love that you named what happens in our body when we name things and when we are acknowledge and articulate them. For me, the title, when I was invited to this discussion, what came up for me was compromising, was putting myself beneath, was years of making choices that were not choices that I wanted to make because of comparative, you know, making comparisons of, of other people. So I love that because for me, it, it sits in my body, right? So I love that you named it in that way. So that's what this title does for me, right? It, it brings up those actions that I've taken because of the way that I'm feeling in my body. Just to piggyback a little bit off of what you just said, Dr. Cindy, you know, it, when I was first approached about doing this workshop, I felt a lot of anxiety. <laughs> I felt a lot of anxiety uh, because as a social worker, you know, I, I, I always want to be mindful and I am mindful of how people are receiving the information that I'm sharing. Um, and the first thing I thought was, oh my goodness, you know, what are my, my uh, friends that are white going to think when I start promoting that I'm part of this, that I am part of this workshop? Um, so I, I saw in the poll, and I don't know um, if our folks in the back can share the results of that poll, but a lot of folks also feel the same thing. Uh, and it, I think it speaks to the bravery of all of us here to participate in this uh, workshop and bring our full selves and our authenticity um, to, to be able to express that these discussions can be scary, they can be frightening, they can be anxiety producing, but they still need to be had. And how do we do it in a way that is uh, that is respectful and that honors everyone's experience? Um, oh, the, the poll is up. Um, and as you can see, you know, 31% of folks feel anxiety, uh, almost you know, more than half of, of people feel exhaustion because we are often very tired of carrying that weight and not, uh, not being able to speak on it. And when we do speak on it, you know, having those concerns and those thoughts uh, dismissed. Uh, and 34% of you all said that it's all of the above, anxiety, anger, apathy, exhaustion, sadness, and fear, uh, which only tells me how necessary these discussions, these discussions are. Thank you for that. Do any of the other authors want to jump in? Lisa, I'm so glad that you mentioned anxiety because I still, as I hear that title, I feel the exhaustion. It's like, oh, because, you know, it just reminds me of like assumptions that, you know, I felt growing up that I had to live and the standards and norms that, you know, are placed on you, but then you find out unexpectedly that you're just behind. Um, when I'm thinking about my chapter that I wrote in the Latinx, Latinx and Social Work book, you know, being in a predominantly white institution, coming to college was like the first time I encountered so many white people in one concentrated area. Um, and then it was just really 
that weight of whiteness was just really seeing and feeling like this norm was just placed upon you where you didn't quite fit, you were fully expected to know, fully expected to live out, um, and then realizing that I was behind the whole time. And it reminds me particularly of, I was in my first English class, like it was freshman year, first English class, eight o'clock in the morning. And I remember hearing um, a group of white students in my class as we're waiting for the professor to come in. And they're talking about like these, how English class was in high school for them. And I remember hearing like liter literary works that I'm like, I never read that in high school. So I felt like I had to so already I felt like I had to come in with a vocabulary that I didn't know with um, reading that I should have known with vocabulary that I should have known. Um, so I think it just but then realizing that I was fully behind. So then when I hear that, I like think of those experiences and it's just like, oh, feeling that weight of like that being behind and just those norms and assumptions, I think is what really comes up for me and may come up for other people, too. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Colazzo. That's for, for students that are in the audience. I, I, I would love for you to hone in on what Dr. Colazzo just said, because I know that that was my experience when I first got to grad school um, and, and being expected to know a lot of things that I just didn't know. It wasn't my experience. And then having, you know, to decide if I wanted to pretend if I knew <laughs> or if I wanted to be brave and acknowledge that I didn't. Uh, so thank you so much for, for sharing that experience because I know that it's, it's, it's something that a lot of our students are feeling uh, and should be affirmed. I'm gonna move on to our next question. And this one is for Amelia and for Dr. Quiros. Uh, what have been some of the challenges that you have faced in addressing acts of, of racism or oppression? And what are some actionable steps that you can offer for all social workers and practitioners to use in anti-racist practice? It's a great question. And I have a lot of different hats. Um, I'm going to speak from the adjuncting faculty hat. I've been teaching for more than a decade. And so I've seen this sort of arc of shift at some of the universities trying to get a little bit closer, I think, to the vision of what I would call wholeness um, in the classroom. And so really the hat I wanna speak from is as a professor and as a facilitator and consultant, you know, one of the biggest challenges I think are the very implicit and I think very culturally subtle, but very loud for our community norms in classrooms or spaces of learning that, um, you know, the tools of white supremacy really can feel like urgency, rigidity, perfectionism, and as someone that's queer and non-binary, I don't already fit into a lot of those sort of perfect boxes or ways of saying things the right way or looking like a professor. And I remember at the very beginning, really naming with other faculty of color that it would be okay for me to just be myself and that that was actually what students were looking for. And it took years to actually get to that place to really understand that there was a space and a need. And so I think white supremacy does this very creative job. It's very slippery. It often will sort of shift, it shape shifts, right? In different arenas of our work. And where I see it in our education process is that students and faculty alike often feel like they don't belong. And so um, as someone who really centers anti-racist pedagogy and as a trauma therapist, um, I'm gonna speak as a clinician for a moment. I think one of the ways, and I wanted to respond to the earlier question around this too, um, about holding the weight of whiteness, that um, white supremacy, we carry that in us, right? The, the histories and lineages we carry as well. And I'll speak for myself as a multiracial person that um, we carry that lineage internally and um, white supremacy has been very creative in fragmenting us internally. So I really see the current project in this work for me clinically and educationally as trying to create a trauma conscious space where we can all work toward wholeness because that fragmentation shows up in students work and what parts of ourselves we leave outside the room. And for second and third generation folks, there's language loss in that too. So when I hear holding the weight of whiteness, the first word that comes to mind for me is grieving and what we might have to grieve in order to get to the place where we can actually say, I, I demand and I deserve to actually be whole here. 
So much of what you said, Amelia, resonates with me too. Um, and I think I could probably list off, you know, everyday interactions that I've had where I've experienced um, discrimination, microaggressions, macroaggressions. But I want to kind of uplift also what Amelia said in terms of understanding whiteness as an ideology and as a way of being that is in that is in everything that we do right and so i think it's important you know we talk about social work as a person and environment a field right so and understanding how larger systems of oppression affect the individual and the individual's mental health and so as a person of color a woman of color a faculty of color when i walk into an mostly all white space I feel that, right? No matter how many years I've been at an institution, no matter how what my level is, there's a ways in which I have to prepare for every single meeting. And that means, you know, making sure my pad is next to me, making sure I am hydrated, have my water, making sure I have my phone so I can text my allies and my 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 friends in, in those moments when that does show up, right? So I think for me, it's an it's an everyday lived experience and embodiment because we live in a world of white supremacy and higher education innately is a system of white supremacy. I think all of us who teach in the classroom have the privilege of being able to create our trauma-informed anti-racist pedagogy and classroom spaces for them to be brave and safe. But once we leave those spaces, we're back into organizational culture. And so what I would like to see is how we work together to, on every day, think about the ways in which we are marginalized, right? And the ways in which we need to uplift women of color in, in that space. Because I also think there's a holding of patriarchy, if we're being honest, true. And I know, Amelia, you do work around intersectionality too. I think we all do, right? And so it's not only sort of me as a woman of color, but it's me as, as a woman. I have a privilege as, as identifying as cisgender, right? I, I live in my privileges and my oppressions. And so I think we really have to take those individual moments and those individual acts of racism and then think about the larger systems, right? And, and I also think that I want us all here today to live in that space of imagination because we all know that social justice work is about imagination, it's about envisioning, it's about being able to envision a place where people do look like us, right? Where there are positions in leadership. I held the I held the role as associate dean for less than two years because I was the only one in that position that looked like me. I had no mentor, I had no guidance, and it was just, it was tearing my soul. And being a mother of two young kids, I couldn't come home every day in that sort of angry space. I needed to find ways to heal. And the last thing I just want to mention is that, you know, there's a lot of work around post-traumatic growth, right? That trauma, there's opportunity, We've all learned in the past two years, somewhere there's opportunity in the trauma we all have experienced. So as, as a person of color in predominantly white institutions, I'm always thinking about ways in which I have been forced to learn myself and to become aware of my reactions and who I am because I have to. Right. And so I think that is, I take that as a blessing, right? It's it's in hypervigilance, it's in intentionality and mindfulness, but it's a blessing because I know myself and I know how I have to navigate situations. And I think the last thing I want to mention is like curate your community, right? Curate those people that you can text in the middle of the meeting and say, could you say that for me? Or I'm not feeling this or take a deep breath and calm down. So I think, you know, I have not gotten this far alone at all. And so I just want to also lift up my friends and my colleagues who have helped me um, rise in this space and all of you on, on this panel today. So um, living community also. I love that our actionable items are very shared. So mine were find your people and yes. have them with you at all times. <laughs> Um, and also, you know, I would, I want to uplift in name. So I, I'm identified as a mixed race Chicanx person. And so I grew up really steeped in a multicultural and bicultural family. And I work with a lot of clients in New York, grew up in similar dynamics. And there's a growing need to really look at what happens in multiracial family dynamics and the traumas that happen there. So for folks in the audience that may be multiracial, we also have a unique kind of charge in this conversation because I actually am the safe one to hire a lot of the times because I walk in the room with a lot of light skin privilege. And so the actionable item I really wanted to make sure I lifted up and gave voice to today was that for folks with light skin privilege, it's on us as well in these spaces as the comfortable ones. Sometimes they get hired to really also 
find a way to be very closely allied with our Black colleagues and to really name and sometimes be that one that says, I'm going to be the voice piece right now because my colleagues can't or because they're so exhausted. And so there's differential on this panel and experience, which I really love. I love that about our book as well, that each chapter really is a unique narrative of a pathway to this experience that we're in right now as providers. Um, but I really did want to lift up a little bit around what we're looking at right now around um, multiracial healing and the need to uplift mixed people as a key community that have sort of selectively been left out in the past around anti-racist organizing because there's been so much confusion about where to actually show up and be heard. And so there is this new um, emerging work right now to give a call out to say we're here and we really want to do the healing internally to do what's right to show up and not be replicating a lot of um, the perfection and rigidity and um, intensity of settler colonialism and all those legacies we bring with us. So I, I do want to name that too. Absolutely. Yeah. Supporting that as well. Thank you. Those, those are all incredible points. Um, and I, and I, I want to hone in on one part in particular um, about being in spaces where you're often the only one. Uh, and, you know, having to take inventory of how much you are willing to give and how you are going to show up because it does impact other parts of, of your life, of your home life, of your relationships, uh, which leads me into my next question. And this is for all of you. And Amelia, you, 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 you touched on it a little bit, but how would you advise other people or how would you want other people in a perfect world to show up in spaces where, where oppression is taking place, where there are microaggressions, where there's discrimination uh, and where there's racism? Uh, I, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so much of what uh, Amelia and Laura said just resonated so much for me in the way that, you know, you show up like you are the gift, right? We, we come before, uh, you know, so many people, but then there were so many folks behind us, right? Our ancestors. When I show up in spaces, I show up in that I bring in my ancestors in the room. Just yesterday, I was setting up my office uh, to start for the semester and I have an altar in my space. I have my uh, crystals in my space. I bring my ancestors' pictures in the space. So I set up my shield of strength of, of all of those that have come before me, right? And so in the same way that you get your people physically that are in the here and now physically, I get my people in the spiritual realm, right? I get my people uh, and I identify as an Afro-Latina Dominican and, and there's a lot of sort of anti-Black practices within my own culture, right? So I acknowledge that and I also show up experiencing joy. I show up you know, as my authentic self, right? And so there's going to be both ends so many times, uh, but showing up authentically is not easy. And when you got your peoples, right, you're able to do that more readily. And, and, and it took me a while to set up my space. I worked for 12 years for Columbia School of Social Work as an associate director of field education, walked in as the first Latina in the space, right? And, and wasn't sure, like, do I set up my, my cultural items? I like to have items in my space that remind me that I am the gift. Like, y'all are lucky to have me here, right? And I don't always feel that way all of the time. Like, let's acknowledge that. And, and I bring those practices in the space, the mindfulness, the prayers, right? The uh, affirmations. So I bring all of that that we tell our clients I, I'm so ready to do that for myself, first and foremost. I did that this morning, right before I was going to be on this uh, conversation with you all. So that's my invitation, is that we bring in our arsenal of ancestors into the space so that we can have additional ways of experiencing joy, experiencing connection, and tapping into the gifts that we have to give to the world. Because it isn't always easy to do that, but we could do that if we're consistent with it as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Does anyone else? I said, what you're talking about remind me of, I talk about this practice of use of self, right? So how do we teach our students to understand and know who they are, like their positionality, their identity, how they show up, and then use that as 
gifts for practice, right? Social work does this, it talks about, you know, you hear traditional social work, don't disclose, don't share information, but that's a very Western way of being, right? So how do we lean into more non, you know, non-traditional free ways of sort of what I call using ourselves and our identity and practice to open up the space for other people to share and tell their own stories. And so that sort of image of how you presented your office just really like I felt light because I could see it. And, and I thought about ways in which that representation can feel inviting and bring a sense of belonging and our unique characteristics into that space. I mean, one of the things I love about this book, I told Erica this a long time ago, is that, you know, when I went to school to get my master's, the human behavior had like a chapter on this is what it means to be Latino. It it said Latino. And I was like, whoa. And like, this is not my experience. This is not who I am. Like, why are we conflating race and culture? Why are we not looking at the complexity and the richness of all of this from language to skin color to, you know, ways in which we present ourselves. And so I think this book is, is, you know, one of my takeaways is buy the book and read it because you'll see sort of this broad picture of what this community looks like and feels like. And I want to encourage students out there, use yourself in practice, you know, understand who you are, bring, those are your gifts, learn the interventions, but learn yourself so you can bring those gifts to practice as well. I, I was, so oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Dr. I was um, going to to add to what Dr. Guido said um, is, you know, bringing your sense of self and then also like using discomfort, leaning into discomfort, because I think um, part of battling oppression, because oppression, right, strips, tries to strip one of their identity, their uniqueness, of their autonomy, of their of their voice um, but what you're bringing in is you're bringing in difference um but also saying like i'm going to use this discomfort and use it in a conversation because sometimes yeah right there we it's like do i bring this do i bring that do i show my th- authentic self um and it brings up a comfort and a discomfort in us but i think right when we bring that out there's also discomfort in the room unfortunately and i think what we do is we can utilize that discomfort to then open up the conversation cuz many times we're okay with shying away from discomfort right we're like no negative feelings away um and many times we've been taught that i know my family's like negative feelings you deal with that on your own um but you know leaning into that discomfort and opening up the conversation i think that has to also be paired with your sense of self as well these are all excellent points and i'm i'm I, facilitating this discussion is really interesting because you you're answering the questions before i even get <laughs> before i even get to them um, which is which is which just speaks to the, the the synchronicity of having to have these conversations. Um, but I just the, the, the next question I feel like uh, Dr. Cindy and, and Dr. Colazzo, you've already touched on, but would love to hear more is that in your chapters, you speak about very specific ways uh, that you have encountered white supremacy and how uh, you you use your practice and your own experiences to battle that. Uh, so what do you in your work uh, in individual space, spaces, how do you uh, uh, see the way that you work with folks, the different experiences that you've had uh, as part of the larger framework to combat white supremacy and, and systemic oppression in social work? Uh, uh, Dr. Cindy, I know that you talked about embodying joy and the different self-care practices and how that's a direct that's a direct assault on on white supremacy. And Jasmine, you shared some interesting thoughts too. Would love to hear more about that. Uh, what a great question, Luisa. Because uh, what's so fascinating is that in my multiple roles that I've played, I have always been, um, you know, not the unusual person, the unusual, and that I've done different things. I remember coming into. Uh, I had, was a school social worker for eight years. And even in that space, I mean, the work that I did individually to support families, the advocacy work, the consulting with teachers, continuously thinking about my role as a social worker, right? My role as a social justice advocate, thinking about, you know, when I became a school social worker, supporting social work interns, I knew that that was a way that I could 
you know, share, most pay it forward in the role of the social work field, but also support. And, and my interns were Latina and, and students of color that were navigating themselves and navigating the field, right? And so I always think about my role as being intentional and that I'm meant to be there. And what role am I playing right now today, right? When, uh, and I'm always taking leaps and risks. I talked a little bit about that in my chapter. I was for 12 years working at Columbia School of Social Work. When I got my doctorate in urban education, I mean, thinking about the topic that I chose to uh, research, that in and of itself was an individual decision, but also it was a decision that some people said, you know, you're going to pigeonhole yourself. Looking at bilingual Latinx school social workers in New York City's Department of Education schools as culturally responsive practitioners, because I felt like somebody got to talk about this. No one is talking about this, but that didn't come with risk. It didn't come with challenge. And I talked about that in my chat. Chapter. I'm scared a lot of the time, and I do it anyway, uh, right? <laughs> and so, and, and, and that's, for me, that's it, knowing that this work was meant for me to do it. There is something that every single person on this Zoom call is meant to do, that people are waiting for that. So I think about that every morning, every day when I'm talking to my students, my social work students, I teach bachelor's and master level students. And when I left Columbia to do that, I knew that that was what I was meant to do, even if it was a pay cut, even if there were things that I had to rearrange in my life, because I knew that individually there are things that I'm meant to do to support the collective. Right, And that was done with the self-care work that Dr. Quiroz talked about, the knowing of myself and taking that risk to get to know myself, right? And acknowledging the steps along the way. I, I talk about it all the time. My family, they were uh, racist against Black people, but my mother was darker than I was, right? And I didn't really understand that until I was sitting in a Bachelor's of Social Work course thinking, oh my goodness, right? But that's the work that we get to do and knowing that as an individual, I have a role to play to move on the collective. And that is asking for help and support has been also a way of, of making those transitions and knowing that while I'm here doing it by myself, I'm not here doing it by myself, right? I absolutely love that. And one word that stuck out to me was your use of intentionality. And that is really what has driven me as well. For me, um, it is about like dismantling the notion of what social work is because it's still, it's still dominantly white, you know, and I am one where I have a lot of different passions. Sometimes I'm guilty of getting involved in too many things um, because I just don't see enough of us and uh, enough of our people in social work. So like I try to have a foot, a hand, a head in the door to try to really get into spaces. And that's what I really try to be intentional with the roles that I take on. So, you know, being an adjunct professor, like. I didn't have any uh, professors of color in my bachelor's degree or in my um, master's degree. So, you know, I wanted to be intentional in providing that space and like saying like, these are social workers of color who are just as great as Mary Richmond and Jane Addams and, you know, all these. I want to be able to open up a book, have a class where we talk about the foundations of social work, when we talk about the impact of social work that Jane Adams and Mary Richmond are not one of the first people that come to our heads or when it comes to social work. So for me, that's going into academia, being a professor, that it, when it comes to you know providing therapy, we know that there aren't enough therapists of color. So I said, okay, I'm opening up a part-time private practice so I can be in that space. And then I joined a mental health tech startup, which is all about providing mental health support and coaching to adolescents and youth of color um, who aren't able to have affirming therapists of color, who aren't able to have mental health support or have that access, especially with our population. Um, you know, we are very much trying to get into like low income Medicaid system so that that quality support is there. And I'm involved in that too. And it's all about being intentional and dismantling the whiteness in social work still. And just like, you're in that, you're in that, you're in that you're a social worker and you're a Latina too. So that is 
big part for me. Lisa, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I, I want to uplift what you both just said. Um, and if I may, you know, I think that that's definitely been my experience as well. You know, Erica Sandoval, everybody here at NYU, but Erica Sandoval can, can attest to this. You know, I have my hand in everything. And a lot of the things that I have my hand on, you know, when I first get there, the imposter syndrome is real. Uh, because I haven't done it, because I haven't seen other people, uh, other Latinas, other Afro Latinas do it, because I am the first one, because I am the only one. But then the intentionality of my social work is that for future generations, I want them to be able to say that there was someone that came before them, and that's where they got their inspiration and the fuerza to actually do the work. Uh, you know, with with uh, increasing the pipeline of, of Latinx social workers, that's important because those are the people that are going out to the communities and working with folks. And I know that if my mother needed a social worker, she wants to talk to someone who speaks Spanish, who looks like her, who has her experience, and who is able to speak on her experiences. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to do that if I wasn't in that space, pushing for that, advocating for that, getting the money for that, fundraising for that. Uh, so that's why it's so important for us to show up because when we think of social work, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years from now, I don't want people to just say that it was Jane Addams or Mary Richmond or any number of white men that came before. It's us. We're the future. We're the future. Uh, so I, I, I love what you just said. It speaks so much to me. Um, and, and I really hope that it resonates with folks in the audience. Um, and it's a beautiful segue uh, for the next question uh, on the Latinx and Social Work book. Why was it important for all of you and this is for all of you to participate in the Latinx and social work project. And what is it that you want our readers to take away from each of your narratives, which are all so different and yet so similar? What do you want folks to take away from that? I think for me, it's a great question. I think for me, and I think, you know, I spent a lot of time with Erica talking about this in the beginning is that, there's a lot of complexity in this culture, and I don't. And I think the when you close your eyes and you think of what it means to be Latinx, you have a vision of somebody. And my kind of um, hope is that people expand those markets of identity. That there is so much complexity. I mean, I think Amelia and I both share sort of a biracial um, upbringing, right? I'm I'm my, I'm also Jewish, right? And when I tell people I'm Jewish, people like are like, "What? You're what? You're you know? I'm not." bilingual. So that throws people off too. And so I think, how can we live in this space of expansion and not constriction? Expansion takes leaning into our learning edge. Expansion takes imagination. Expansion takes vision. And so what I hope is that people understand the complexity of our identity and that we are not just that visual representation of what you see. And in order to sincerely live the social work mission of social justice, we can't be scared to ask questions to honor curiosity. We can't be scared to sit, sit in those moments of accountability and understand how sometimes our intention doesn't match our impact, right? And so this book for me is pretty revolutionary because it broadens the scope of what it means to be Latinx and it sincerely connects to the social justice mission of social work. And the last thing I wanna say is that I also want people to lean into imagination, right? Visioning, imagination, healing. There is so much richness in our culture that we have not even tapped into. I've been trying to move away from the intellectual space and lean into more of the spiritual space, studying theology, thinking about ways that we could heal each other, the community. That's not going to only be through cognitive intellectual spaces, right? It's going to be through energy. It's going to be through healing. It's going to be through, through guidance in different sort of ways. So how do we do that? So that's, um, you know, that's really why I wanted to step into this and, and um, be courageous and share space with all of you. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Kiros. What an amazing awesome. question. First of all, uh, when I was approached to be a part of this project, you know, I remember thinking to myself, I'm not ready for this. I had a lot of things going on. And I actually said no at first, to be honest and transparent. And, and then when I began to write the chapter and it was really reading the other chapters and thinking to myself, how did 
Eric, I know to tap into each of these individuals. I, I felt like every single chapter spoke to me in such a personal way. Every single chapter created like these healing vibes, right? There was the intellectual pieces, the spiritual pieces, the intergenerational trauma, you know, where people were, you know, really sharing of themselves. And I'm so grateful that this book was curated. And then the way it was curated, so much love, so much patience. And I invite each of you, if you have not purchased this book, go ahead and do that. Share it with your primas, share it with your comadres, share it with your peoples, especially your peoples that aren't familiar with Latinx stories. They're so diverse, these stories, so amazing. And I, I want folks to read it and then write your story. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cindy. And I encourage everyone to do the same. Uh, we are coming to the end. Uh, so I have one final question. And this one uh, will also go in uh, for everybody that is in the audience. For all of our authors, please uh, share one word that centers your work and that you would like to leave all of us with? I can In the chat, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you want us to put it in the chat? Yes, please. All right, thank you. I see solidarity, I see resiliency, appreciate purpose, power, gratitude, admiration, power, comunidad, absolutely, support, resistance, I love it, orgullo, inspired, positive energy. Unsurprisingly, these are all of the things that you are going to feel when you read this book and when you engage with the stories of all of these incredible authors, you will find stories of connection, of inspiration, of transformation, uh, and you're going to uh, learn so much about each of the authors, but you know, so much about their community and where they come from as well. So I encourage you all, as, as we've been encouraging all along, to please get a copy of this book, share it with everybody in your network, share it with your moms, your abuelas, your tias, your primas, your friends, uh, and have those conversations. It's going to inspire a lot of important uh, and, and sometimes challenging, but always uplifting conversations. I encourage you, please read the book. It's incredible. Um, I want to thank you all uh, for sharing your words. Keep sharing your words. Uh, I want to thank our authors for this incredible panel. I want to thank our guests for your wonderful participation. This is one of the liveliest chats I have ever seen, <laughs> which is wonderful because the message is resonating. And I encourage you all to take a moment uh, when we open up our Q&A to please fill out the brief survey before you leave today. Again, it will help inform future workshops, future events. This event obviously is resonating a lot with all of you and we want to keep it going. We want to keep this momentum going and we want to be able to curate more spaces like this where we can have these tough conversations and do it with love and do it with respect and do it uh, while uplifting ourselves in each other. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over uh, to Richeline to facilitate their Q&A portion. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa, for doing such a wonderful, wonderful job with um, our uh, facilitation of the panel. You know, um, when I entered into this space, um, oftentimes I'm so surprised that people are listening. And we have been listening to every one of you. Um, I, I, I was taking down notes because my heart was filling up and feeling so overwhelmed with gratitude and appreciation for everyone. But I want to be able to kind of go into the, the, the Q&A section um, and ask people, you know, if they have any questions. And I'm going to turn it over um, to um, our facilitator to... Um, 
see what's in the chat and to be able to continue this conversation. What is showing up for, for you um, in this space? I know for a lot of the students here at NYU at, at Silver, oftentimes, you know, the elephant in the room is this holding of a whiteness. And I know we spoke about it a little bit earlier today, but just kind of thinking back to, you know, when you were a student in these spaces, what did it feel like? And what would be some of the strategies that you would offer to our students who are experiencing this um, on a daily basis, um, who may not have the connections, um, the resources, the support um, for them? How can we build community for them in these spaces? Back to Shapiro. Well, I see that we have two questions so far. And one is way up here, but it's from um, Sharifa. I don't know if she wants to repeat her question, because I'm trying to look for it. It's a little bit up here. So her question was, this is from Sharif, I mean, uh, what are some suggestions that you would give to BIA students in navigating a predominantly white classroom space where they are constantly fighting to be heard and feeling like the elephant in the room that is not being directly addressed? I could copy her question again here. I mean, I think my first response to that is to um, find faculty or administration that you feel you can connect with. I think, you know, a lot of, I would say that a lot of the responsibility of creating these, these communities is on faculty and administration, right? Like, you have to hold spaces like this. You have to sort of lean into ways in which you are creating that space for students. And I think for students, you know, I, I tell my students this, find a faculty member, find a, an administrator, find somebody that you can connect to and then build off of that because most likely that person probably went through something similar. Hopefully they'll share your story and then you can build off of that. I think sometimes we're often fearful of stepping in and being courageous and reaching out, but I think we have to do that, right? Courage, it's a big one. Um, but I would start there, you know, find find somebody who you feel like you connect, connect to and introduce yourself um, and, and take it from there. But then also really faculty and ministries in the room, like how are you creating those spaces for students to be brave and courageous? I want to add to that. And yeah, I 100% agree about where the responsibility lies. Um, and I also want to say I'm also a student right now. So I'm in a doctoral program. I'm the I wasn't at the beginning the only Latinx person there, but now I am. And it has really shifted. And so I can really, my heart sort of just pounded at that question. Um, and so I'm having sort of a dual experience of both doing this work um, at, you know, as a professional in spaces, trying to support students. And now I'm experiencing on the other side, um, a lot of isolation and frustration. And um, I would just say unexpected allies. I've been very, very, pleased to find unexpected allies in spaces that I would probably not have generally assumed there would be an audience to hear me out on some of the dynamics in the classrooms that I'm in right now as a learner. Um, and so I do think that if you're in a school where there are not visible BIPOC folks or where you really are the only one, and that happens a lot, right? It happens a lot in our higher ed, that there may be other people with marginal identities that you can actually go to and find a way to connect across identity and that that actually can be really, really strong. If we think about ecology and we just think about what makes uh, environment strong, it's lots of different types of organisms working together. And I think that there's something to also be said about the ways we can look for and, and maybe ask to be heard, but we have to believe that we have a story to tell. And so I think this book is powerful for me in that way too, and in, in being able to tell a story I didn't think wanted to be heard and I'm realizing it actually really did. Um, and so I would just encourage that on the most, more micro level um, in just sort of taking the risk of saying, hey, this is happening to me um, or this has been my experience. What do you think? Have you observed that? Uh, 
All right, thank you. Uh, we have another question from another participant. I'm gonna also um, paste it here so that you can see it, but I'll read it as well. I'm re I've been reflecting on how much whiteness I have claimed as my own and just recently been exploring how to reconnect with myself and my Latinx roots. And I'm wondering if that, if the speakers also went through a moment like that and if they can reflect on how they have reclaimed that authenticity in their lives and work. What a great question. So I shared, I grew up in the Highbridge section of the Bronx in Highbridge Gardens projects where there was mostly uh, black and Puerto Rican folks. I didn't grow up with a lot of Dominicans. And I remember going to undergraduate school at the SUNY Stony Brook uh, School of Social Work. And I was placed at an elementary school in Washington Heights. And I was so happy because I said, oh my goodness, I'm gonna get to connect to my Dominican people. Right. And it was through that experience that, you know, there were ebbs and flows in that connection. My field instructor was Dominican mm -hmm. from Dominican Republic, but I did not, uh, I was not born in Dominican Republic. And my Spanish was like Cibaeña Spanish, which for those of you that don't know what the word Cibaeña means, it was sort of like what seemed to some people as like low level country Spanish. Right. And that journey was so transformative for me because what I had to learn was that I, it was okay being this kind of Latina, right? That was born and raised in New York City in the Boogie Down Bronx and that I could represent the Bronx and represent being Latina and represent being a Dominican that speaks Ibaña Spanish and that that was okay. And I did that through connecting with other people. Right. And, and I remember joining the Latinx group, not feeling Latinx enough, joining the black group, but I wasn't black enough. Right. And so I created sort of my own little spaces and it wasn't easy. Right. And I find now that with uh, social media wasn't present when I was around, but I've been able to make connections with folks that are like me on Instagram, Facebook. I mean, that's what keeps me on social media, right? All, all these amazing connections. And so it was hard and still is hard, right? I'm, I'm currently a board member of 100 Hispanic women. And I was first a scholar and because I was seeking that connection, that realignment with my Latinidad. And I could do that. And even in those spaces, I'm always using that social justice voice, right? Like, why aren't there enough Latina folks that look like me on here or darker, right? And so, you know, so that has been my journey. And I continue to be in that space. And now that I have children, you know, teaching them how proud we are to be Latina, even if you don't have that bilingual Spanish speaking um, experience, right? Uh, my kids are not bilingual, bilingual Spanish speaking. And my mother was giving it to me all the time because they were not, right? And it's allowing you to feel comfortable and confident in whatever Latinidad experience you have, right? And, and, and being intentional about it, right? Finding that space, finding that space because that space, sometimes it comes to you, uh, but, but you gotta go get it, right? And, and curate that for yourself sometimes. We want to just, again, thank the panelists so much um, for um, their sharing of their experiences, their um, gifts, their loves, their selves um, during this uh, wonderful, wonderful panel um, presentation. But this could not have been possible without the wonderful, wonderful Erica Sandoval who has brought all these wonderful people together. She is an amazing gift, amazing force of energy, filled with love. And um, I just wanna bring Erica into this space to be able to bring us home. And so that we can continue to build upon this important work that she has birthed and just brought forward to be able to share with each and every one of us. So again, my thank you to the panel and my, over abundance, thank you, and gratitude to Erica. Micheline, thank you so much for that warm, warm welcome, as always. As you all know, I'm Erica Sandoval. Um, I'm the daughter of my mother, Laura Sandoval, who came to this country at 22 years old with a purpose. We all have purpose. And today, all of this validated my purpose. 
I can't thank you all enough for joining us today. Today's panel, as we unpack the weight of whiteness and creating space for all of us. And of course, a huge thank you to my alma mater, NYU Silver, for being an incredible partner to the Latinx and social work and leading these incredible discussion series and always believing in the importance of Latinx and social work. I'd like to take the time to honor all the contributing authors today. And if they can just use their heart emoji to identify themselves that came in and joined, please do. This would not have been possible without all of your contributions. And to my madrina, Dr. Linda Lassell Bryan, mil gracias. So much of this is of course due to Richelene DeShield. Thank you for your leadership and vision and guiding these workshops. And to Luisa Lopez for co-facilitating today. You were amazing. The panel guests, so powerful, so authentic, always leading with vulnerability. Thank you, Amelia, Dr. Colazo, Dr. Bautista, and Dr. Quiros. Yes, I know, I know you personally, and I would call you by your first name, but you own and you earned that doctorate. So I'm going to shout it out. And it's an absolute privilege to learn from all of you and soak up your wisdom on this topic that isn't talked about nearly as much as it needs to be. When I set out to create Latinx and Social Work, I knew it was more than just a book. It was really the beginning of a movement, one where we could claim space, share a narrative, and drive our own healing. But finally seeing the words jump off the page and manifest as this panel was still incredibly special. I had to hold back the tears. I really did. And today, as I witnessed our community grow, it was amazing. Amazing. I know I'm going to be just as moved during the next two events we built for this discussion series, and so will you. The next one is accountability to the Black and Afro Latinx communities, which is on February 24th at 10 a.m., and the one after that is Una Conversación con las Madrinas on March 24th at 6 p.m. during Social Work Month. These are conversations social workers need to be having in order to best serve our clients and make space for ourselves in this profession. I feel so lucky to be part of an advancing this dialogue together. Both panels will be on Zoom and we'll drop the registration links in the chat. And in between this event, please stay connected with each other, with us, stay connected to Latinx and social work. Please follow us on, on social media. There's so many incredible things to share and have an incredible day. And I hope this really uplifted you and brought some love and light to the rest of your day. Thank you so much for coming.